Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. The English language is a very flexible language. I think the reason why English has taken off worldwide is because it's so flexible that it seems like cultures and people groups all over the world are able to take the English language and over time it's evolved, it's been palatable, it's been able to morph, and it's been able to be used in a lot of different ways. Um, and you've seen it evolve over time. However, I think what happens with the English language when this, when it has been so flexible is we've lo- lost a lot of distinctions in the language we use. We've lost a lot of the nuance of language. You look at other languages, like the Greek language, for example, or at least classical Greek, and there's a lot of distinction around words and the meaning of words. And English seems to distill things down to basic uh, language ideas. Now, I'm not a linguist, so I don't know all the exact nuances of all this, but I do know that English seems to, like, for example, there's like f- several words in classical Greek for love, different flavors and types of love. And in English, there's one word, love. I love this hamburger or I love my wife, right? So we have this this one word that's supposed to encapsulate a lot of different meanings. And out of this, as we go through life, this can cause a lot of misunderstanding in the world because we have words we use for things and we lump things together categorically in language and we might have a different meaning than the person hearing what we say is hearing right we have something we're saying like you know i love a hamburger versus i love my wife well that love is very different in how we say it so today we want to talk a little bit about language and a little bit about creating distinctions in language and how we think that creating better distinctions and how we go about with language will create more understanding between people and more understanding between cultures and, and grow us as people as in general. Yeah. I, I'm not a linguist either. <laughs> so I actually, I, I, I suspect that the English language has taken over the world, maybe because of its flexibility. I think it's just because... Americans are really good colonists. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and so uh, that's, you know, it's, it became the economic language. It, it could be because of its flexibility as well. But I, I think what you mentioned there, though, about uh, basically everything you said there is really fascinating to me because we mistake uh, this concept that when we use you know, when we use a word or when we use a phrase or when we're talking to the other person, the picture in our head as we're talking is being somehow projected or transmitted into the head of the person that is listening to us. And so we massively overvalue our ability to communicate effectively with other people. We believe that the same picture in our head is the same picture in their head. And when we, you know, we, we talk about this when we're describing the perspectives process, the perspectives cognitive function that all INJs in the Myers-Briggs or NJs, intuitive judgers in the Myers-Briggs system, they use this cognitive function called, it's technically called introverted intuition. We call it perspectives. And if you want more of an in-depth look in, into what that looks like, we did a podcast on extroverted intuition versus introverted intuition. So go reference that. But When we talk about the perspectives process, one of the things that we really appreciate about it is that there's a segment of the population that just gets, you know, on an instinctive level, that the picture in my head when I'm talking is not the same picture in your head when you're listening to me, right? Like, like when we talk about physical, tangible objects, we usually use the example of a teacup. When I use the word teacup, there is a picture in my head when I use the word teacup, and it could be the first teacup I ever saw, or it could be the last teacup, the teacup that I'm using right now, or it could be a conglomeration of every teacup I've ever, you know, used in the past. It could just be an abstraction of the concept of of teacup. And when I use the word teacup, I assume you know what I'm talking about, but the picture in your head is going to be different than the picture in my head. You're going to have a different teacup in your head as I use that word. Now, teacup is really easy because we usually, you know, refer to it in terms of its functionality, right? It's a cup that is used to carry hot beverage, hot liquid, you know, and that I drink out of. And so when we talk about concrete, tangible objects, that's really, you know, it's pretty easy to communicate even if we have different pictures in our heads. In the communication process, it's not so important that I know the ornation of it, for example, 
as long as I understand that the meaning behind it, because you're talking about a cup that I can drink out of, probably a hot liquid. Yeah, yeah, exactly. However, when we start getting into words that are highly abstract, right? Like words like integrity, or like you use the word love. Now we run into a problem because the word integrity can have a million different connotations and it doesn't have a specific, tangible, concrete, physical representation that we can just hold on to. I mean, we might have applied that. We could have maybe an image in our head of a person who we think was a great example of integrity. Politicians, for example. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> the first thing I jumped to, right? <laughs> so... So we have this, uh, we're going to have a concept of integrity, but it's going to be mostly filled with abstraction. So as we communicate, as we talk, and we use these abstract concepts, this, this idea that everybody's got the same picture in their head is, well, it's, it's not even close to reality. It's not even close to it. There's no way that everybody has the same pictures in their heads. And so that creates a lot of misunderstandings in communication. It creates a lot of, uh, you know, arguments that probably didn't need to exist. That said, you know, we, we reference Alfred Krasipsky quite a bit in this podcast because we, we love his concept that the map is not the territory. And effectively what he meant by this when he was talking about it, it, Alfred Krasipsky is a pioneer of a concept called general semantics. And if you want to do a really fascinating research project, just start diving into general semantics. So basically change the way you see reality, <laughs> mm-hmm. or at least it should. And it's it's not really something that you... General semantics is not something that you understand. General semantics is a it's it's a discipline. It only really works if you do it. All right. And that is see the world through the lens of this concept of general semantics. Now, just as a really quick overview, general semantics is basically the concept that the language we use to encapsulate our ideas, our thoughts, our feelings, our interactions with the world are always going to be lacking. Yeah. All right. Like we're never actually going to be able to describe the experience with words. The words are just a way of trying to transmit information between each other. Mm -hmm. When we mistake that the words are the thing, right? Like when we mistake that if I explain to you what it was like to go on a five-day backpacking trip in the Grand Canyon, if I mistake that that actually means you have also experienced this with me because I told you about it, Right Mm -hmm. now I'm in trouble because there's no way you could possibly know what it was like to go on a five day backpacking trip in the Grand Canyon. Right. Like unless you were there with me at the very time that I went, actually, unless you were me, yeah. (laughs) like you'd have to actually be me on that backpacking trip to truly understand the experience. But I can explain it to you. I can describe it to you and you can get a concept of it. When we start to think that the words are not just relaying a concept, when we start to think that the words are actually creating an experience in somebody else, then we get into some hot water. The reason why this is so important, and the reason why I say hot water as opposed to just confusion, right, is we end up becoming very attached to these words we use. Yes. And when we attach to the words, we start to mistake the words for the thing. And one of the best examples of how this gets us into hot water is the concept of a prejudice, right? If I have a prejudice against any group, right, any subgroup of people, let's say let's say it's gender, let's say it's men, right? I'm a woman and I have a prejudice against men. And I start talking about men using certain properties, right, sure. using certain adjectives and descriptions. If I mistake that my adjectives and descriptions about men, if I start to believe that that's real – then I'm going to enter the world believing that all men share these, you know, share these characteristics. It could be a couple of men that I've run into that are douchebags, or I could have run into a man who I didn't understand and was trying, you know, had good intents, but I didn't get it, right? And so now I start to apply this to all men, right? And I mistake the word man and all of my descriptions for the reality. I start to think that the words are the reality. So I'm going to start behaving towards every man I run into, as if I know this person already because I've already described men. Yeah. And there's about three and a half billion men on the planet to lump all of them into the same category is pretty ridiculous. I mean, there's so much variance and nuance depending on culture, age, 
the way that a man grew up, the way that he presents himself, what he knows, what he's learned, his development levels, his personality type. There's so much nuance to that. To group it all together is... Well, silly. Is, yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, what's weird is we do it all the time. I mean, we say it's silly, but think about your own life. You're listening right now. You do this in your daily life. You're driving down the interstate. I always use the interstate driving example. I don't know. I drive a lot, so I'm always angry in the car. But <laughs> always like it's it's when you're not at your best, but you also know that people can be sympathetic of you not being at your best. Yeah, <laughs> it's for a some great reason. <laughs> but you know, you'll see somebody in a car, and you're like, maybe it's a an older gentleman, and then all of a sudden, I think of all elderly people as terrible drivers. I just lump them all together as terrible drivers. And I mean, that's really just not generous, not fair, and it's grossly oversimplified in using, you know, in language is a symbology mechanism, right? We're taking an idea and we're distilling it down into some type of a, a, a verbal symbol to represent something. And if I grossly over categorize, I have this gigantic category for all these different nuances, it's really, it really leads to gross generalizations, oversimplifications, and ultimately, in my opinion, unhappiness. Because now you see the world through such one-dimensional lenses that you don't have the, the flavor and the nuance of what the reality of the world actually is. So we need to come up with better ways to, to speak and to listen and to categorize and to articulate these words and these symbols that we have that represent reality. Yeah, well, I mean, it's going to lead to, I would agree, I would say that it leads to personal unhappiness. And how can it not? If you have a subgroup of people who have negative intent, right, just as a dark subgroup, how can you possibly be happy if, you know, like a percentage of the population is always out to get you? (laughs) Absolutely. That's just going to create paranoia. That's going to create frustration, paranoia. You're going to think that every old person that's driving is like, you know, two seconds away from hitting your car and, you know, causing your death. Whatever is the subgroup that you have decided is a certain way, right? Like that person is always going to be this like looming specter in the corner, always out to do something terrible to you or to somebody that you love. So, you know, that's... That's not going to create a place of like love and generosity and abundance and all the other stuff that we know is so psychologically, you know, important for us, optimism, etc. You're going to create monsters, basically. And that's what we do. We create ghosts and goblins and monsters in other human beings all the time. And just like you said, you know, like maybe you have a bad interaction with an older person that's driving, right? And then suddenly old people driving is a problem. Yeah. Right? Because you had one. Right, you have one interaction that wasn't so good. I was recently reading on a there's a there's a website called Introvert Deer that the owner of the website has um, you know for a couple different articles has been you know consulting with me to talk you know to talk about like what are some primary characteristics of like INFJs, what are some primary characteristics of INTJs, yeah. And so she quoted me in some of the articles, and I remember reading the the most recent article she wrote is on INTJs, and at the bottom there were two people who both self-identify as introverts, that are, they go off on extroverts. Like, on a level where they're like, I've never known an extrovert to ever have any positive intent for their children. This is what they're saying. Like, <laughs> like they've only ever used their children for narcissistic means. And, you know, I'm, I'm a, the first person was a, a, a self-proclaimed teenage female INTJ that was talking about how every extrovert they've ever run into is this awful person who, you know, like has no generosity of spirit and only <laughs> wants to, util- you know, use their children for their own personal gain and happiness and that they can't do anything positive without like, you know, yelling it from the rooftops. And then the next person was like, well, I'm a female INTJ in my 50s, and I totally agree. And then that person goes on about how terrible extroverts are. And as I'm reading it, I couldn't help but, like, laugh because this article that they were like, this is a great article. I totally agree with it. Everything you said is spot on. You know, like, I I totally resonate with this. And I'm like, the content that you're resonating with came from an extrovert. (laughs) Like, I'm an extrovert. And all this stuff that you feel so understood by came from an extrovert, the very subgroup that you're vilifying. And of course, this concept that all extroverts are evil is the same thing as like men saying all women are evil or women saying all men. I mean, 50% of the population is extrovert and 50% is introverted. So you're basically saying that of 7 billion people on the planet, 3.5 billion of them are total raging narcissists that only have children for their own self-gratification. 
<laughs> which I thought was great <laughs> and hilarious and a perfect example of what we're talking about, right? Yeah. When we mistake, and, the, and this person, these two people probably, they probably believe this to the core of their being. So the problem is, is that because they mistake their language, they mistake the pictures in their heads and the language that come from that for reality. If they run into an extrovert, what are they going to see? They're going to see a narcissist, thus proving their original premise, because that's what they believe, right? Their words are framing and shaping their belief. They interact with the world and what are they going to find? You're looking for quarters, you're going to find quarters, right? Yeah. Like if you're looking for a narcissist and an extrovert, you're going to find a narcissist, right? You're going to find the thing you're looking for, which just fuels your opinions, all, you know, and, and, and turns you into a loop, right? You get this closed circuit loop of information in that is already what you're looking for. So the big danger of pretending that the language you're thinking in, the language you're speaking, and the language that you're interacting with other people in is reality, right? Like that, that's, it's almost as if people believe that what they speak ends up becoming the world, right? Like, like they're God somehow, and that they speak it, and then they breathe it into reality. And to some extent, they're right. I was that gonna say, does, I agree, yeah. No, yeah. yeah, I mean, to some degree, that, that does, I think, shape your reality, the way you speak. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Keep mm. going. I, no, no. Grabbing some coffee real quick. I know. I, I've been listening. I'll, I'll just be honest. I've been listening to our podcast. I, we got really sick, okay? This month, we have been just, like, crazy sick. Sick every moment. Like, this is basically, like, this is me emerging from, like, just <laughs> the, the sickness that I get every winter. So I've been listening to some of our old podcasts, and I'm like, man, I'm chatty. <laughs> oh. I, <laughs> I do so much talking, and I'm trying to keep my, I'm trying to keep aware of how much talking I'm doing. So as soon as you leaned in, I was like, oh, Joel's gonna talk. <laughs> so I'm not like so monopolizing the the podcast. But yes, uh, they do behave that way, and to some extent, they're right. We breathe into the world our reality. We are gods of our reality, right? Like we get to define our realities based on our perceptions. And so that makes it even more so to be very careful of how you use language, very careful of what you are, quote unquote, breathing into reality, because you will find what you're looking for. Yeah. And so we kind of go back full circle, this idea of general semantics, Gorzybski's idea of general semantics, and this this notion that the words we choose to represent reality are important. And there is some limitation in the language that we've inherited. If you're an English spe speaker, you've inherited a language that doesn't have as much nuance as maybe you'd like. And so we need to find frameworks, especially when we're trying to solve problems. You know, we're looking at a problem. Let's say we're looking at a problem of poverty. Let's just take poverty in, let's just say the United States, the country I live in. Let's say we want to address poverty in the United States. Well, part of addressing poverty is to identify, or you know what, let's be maybe, maybe be more specific. Let's address homelessness, the idea of homelessness. This I read an article recently about, I think it's Salt Lake City has a very low uh, homelessness rate because they're actually giving homeless people homes to live in, right? They're trying to eradicate homelessness through solving the problem by giving people that are homeless these homes. And remember you and I having a discussion about this saying, well, that kind of works for some homeless people, but what if it's a person that maybe is mentally disabled and they're unable to handle having a house given to them or some dwelling place? Like they need maybe an institution to help them. And we got around this conversation of, well, maybe there needs to be better classification of people who are homeless. To solve this problem of homelessness, it's not like, obviously there's a broad category of the homeless, people that don't people have- People who don't have homes. <laughs> exactly. Definition, they don't have homes. Right. but. That might be a college student who, you know, has moved out from mom and dad's living in a dorm right now and then is in transition over the summer. They may not have a home. Well, they're technically a homeless person, as well as that 45-year-old man who has been divorced, lost his job, and is now on the streets and doesn't have a place to live. Like, that's a homeless person. Someone who's mentally disabled that uh, is unable to work or maybe their family isn't around and they're also on the streets. They don't have a home. There's People with extreme psychological disorders yeah. like, that can't can't like, they don't even recognize that they're homeless exactly these are all homeless people and there's more types of categories under this broad category of homeless but for let's say a politician addressing the issue of quote-unquote homelessness uh getting clear on what we're actually addressing 
is like the first step. You know how Einstein, I think it was Einstein, or at least we attribute it to Einstein. Yeah. If I was going to solve a problem, I'd spend, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes defining that problem. I'd not, 90, 95% of the time defining the problem and then 5% of the time solving it because the definition matters. And so this is this idea that if we could clearly define what we're talking about, solutions are more possible because we have we have more workable frameworks and models to identify these things. Yeah, well, if you're saying, you know, well, uh, providing houses for the homeless will not solve the homeless problem, right? Just you are already oversimplifying the entire situation. Like you said, there are different kinds of homeless people. So will providing homes help with a certain group of homeless and not with others, right? Because if you cl- if you clump them all together, you are you're going to be wrong with any you know, over, you know, like sweeping, overarching statement, right? Because a, a certain percentage will be helped and a certain percentage won't be helped, right? So if you say this, this is the solution to homelessness, you are by definition wrong because there's going to be a certain percentage that cannot be helped with your solution. And if you say, well, this won't help the homeless population or homeless, you know, this is not a solution, you're wrong because whatever, you know, whatever that is, like say providing homes, there is going to be a certain group of homeless people who are that is the solution to their problem. So anytime you make these, you know, sweeping generalizations, you're going to run into problems. You're going to you're not going to be able to find a solution because you have oversimplified what the problem is just starting out with the premise of your definition. So what Korzybski did and I thought this was just I mean so simple, but it's it's actually a practice I use now. And it has helped solve problems. Like you said, you know, if you had an hour to save the world, you spent 55 minutes defining the problem. So this very, very, very simple thing that he did is he just added numbers to the, you know, adjectives or the nominalizations, the nouns that he gave to people. So if he was going to talk about homelessness or homeless people, he wouldn't say homeless people. He would say homeless people one, homeless people two, homeless people three, homeless people four, right? And so on, depending on how many different categorizations or subsets of homelessness he had. Really simple, right? Homeless people one. Let's say homeless people one is people who are down and out, lost their jobs, had their homes seized, and just need some, you know, assistance to get back on their feet. Let's say homeless people two are people who are deeply psychologically disturbed and will never be able to care for themselves. Let's say homeless people three are, you know, professional couch surfers, people who just kind of float. They're there by choice. <laughs> They're there by choice, right? They just, you yeah. know, they, they, that's just, you know, how they roll. So already you have three totally distinct categorizations of homeless people. So which problems will solve, you know, or which solutions will solve the problem for homeless subset one? Which solutions will help solve the problem for homeless subset two? And so on, right? So now you actually have, because you have different classifications of this, you have to have different solutions. So any one single solution is always going to be the wrong solution if you're trying to apply it to every single subset. Now that's that's a major, you know, that I mean you're you're just biting off a whole huge <laughs> problem with you know with the homeless um situation. But there is somebody out there who is working on this and there's there are people out there who have brilliant ideas about how to, you know, address all of these different subsets. I just don't see it referred to in politics. I don't really hear it talked about. I always hear these kinds of quote unquote problems or challenges that we're facing, I always hear them in the sweeping generalization. So if somebody's working on it, they're doing it in the shadows. They're certainly not doing it on you know, a platform level, a political platform level. That said, I've applied this to almost everything in my life. I've taken this discipline of subset one, subset two, subset three into almost everything. Like you were talking about with love, right? The Greeks had four words for love. And they meant different things. They had you know, they had um, Eros love, which was, you know, erotic love. They had Philea love, which was, you know, friendship, brotherly love. They had Storge, which was like the fam- the love you have for your family members. And then they had Agape. And Agape was principled love. It was like the love I feel for humanity just because they exist. Two, th- those are four totally different subsets of love, right? You love pizza totally different than you love your wife, right? And so you're going to use a different word in, in Greek. And other languages have multiple words for these different variations of loves, uh, love as well. But in English language, we don't. So I think in terms of love subset one, love subset two, love subset three, right? Like different flavors of love. 
this has revolutionized my relationships with other people mm -hmm. because I don't I don't think of it in terms of like you know if I get really pissed off at a man and I'm like oh all men are jerks <laughs> Right? No, men subset one is jerk. <laughs> or maybe not even men subset one. I don't want to put jerks in subset one. I want to put jerks in subset like 10. <laughs> yeah. Right? Men subset one are fabulous. Those are wonderful people. <laughs> I love those dudes. <laughs> men subset 10, those guys are assholes. <laughs> I don't like those guys. <laughs> but it's you create all these subsets. Thus indicating, so, so if a guy treats me jerky, I don't have to say men are jerks. Mm -hmm. I say men subset 10 are jerks. But that gives me nine subsets before that to, to love men. And when I run into them and, you know, interact with them on the street or whatever, I don't have to assume that they're, you know, evil or jerks or assholes or whatever. This, is, this really came home to me when um, I started seeing, uh, yeah, like, these comments about how women, right, women, no subset, women ha um, are legitimate when they have fear of men, right? Like when, when women fear men, that's totally legitimate because there are, are men who will rape them and men that are predators. And these women are totally under, you know, like if they have a total fear of men, that's completely understood, right? That's completely, and, and how could you possibly say that it's anything else because there are men out there who will rape women? Yeah. And I'm like, which women subset and which men subset? That's the first thing I think of, right? Women subset what? Men subset what? If we don't define these, then we can't actually look at the problem. We'll just, you know, we'll just project onto every man we meet that he's a rapist, and we'll project onto every woman we meet as somebody who's a sitting duck, mm -hmm. right? And that's not how it works. So just being able to, like, create subsets of these highly abstract concepts, right? These highly abstract words like man, woman, love, right? Like homeless. That alone helps you, first of all, create a little bit of distance from the paranoia of this whole group of people out there is out to get me. And second, it helps come up with real solutions. <laughs> yeah. You know, this really is comes full circle again to the heart of Personality Hacker. We are interested in your personal growth. We're interested in our personal growth. Personal growth is really the core value and I know we're, we're called personality hacker and personality psychology is a lot of what we do. And the reason why is because of this idea of distinctions. You know, one size doesn't fit all for your personal growth. You pick up a, a personal growth book, it may not be for you, your subset. And we believe that the more nuanced we can get in personality typology, it's not to put people in boxes, it's actually to free us to develop ourselves and grow based on who we are. And so this idea, this general semantics of creating subgroups, creating categories, creating more nuance, more fidelity to who people are, we believe helps facilitate, you know, conversation at the political level if you're trying to solve a problem, but also for you personally, this matters. Because if you know, for example, that you are someone who has authenticity exploration, so you're an INFP in the Myers-Briggs system, and in our system, you have authenticity as your, your driver and and exploration as your co-pilot, well, that's going to matter to you in how you pursue your personal development. That nuance, that understanding, that very specific understanding of who you are as a person is going to speak to how you grow. And there's all sorts of maps and models that you can use to identify yourself and to figure out where what we call the you are here dot. It's just, it really speaks to at a macro level, like what we're talking about with general semantics of being able to clearly identify different people groups, clearly identify different concepts and get specific. But it also on a micro level, of you as a person growing. This matters to you as well because these distinctions are really the heart and soul of what we believe is the best way to customize your personal growth as a person. So I think it could go both ways. And I think that as we as we see this, you know, this idea of general semantics, and I would recommend you go look at a Wikipedia article of general semantics, go read a couple articles on it just to get an idea of this. Because I think it's a really powerful concept, really powerful frame for how to see the world. This idea that the symbology we use, the language we use is just a representation of reality. It is not reality. And the more distinct those words and that language can get, the more understanding and problem, the more understanding we can create and the more problems we can solve, which I think is extremely powerful. Yeah. Well, and just you were talking about, you know, if we're talking about INFPs or authenticity exploration people. Even that has subsets in my mind. Exactly. INFPs 1, INFPs 2, INFPs 3, right? You don't have to be, like, nothing, in my opinion, 
nothing should be, you know, considered to be static, all one thing, right? Like, let's just lump it into a group, and we've and we've handled that now, right? Because the whole concept of general semantics originally was it was supposed to help us with our evaluations, right? Like, we evaluate the world in certain ways. Evaluate means we deem things good or bad. We yeah. deem things as right or wrong, right? When we an evaluation is the launching pad to a decision, right? Like in order to in order to decide, we have to first evaluate. We have to determine what we think is the right and wrong of things. And so general semantics was it was originally intended to be a a finer tuned instrument for making evaluations. It's not just how we like see the world it's not just how we think about the world it's specifically when we make a decision right like what are the evaluated evaluative criteria we're going to use we're all going to use slightly different criteria however when we overgeneralize when we pretend that even though the words we're using to evaluate are somehow objective reality Mm -hmm. right like when we pretend that my saying that an extrovert is always going to be a narcissist, right? And they're only ever going to have children in order to feed their own narcissistic needs. I'm I'm pretending as if that's reality. (laughs) And I'm going to make decisions based on that evaluation. I have evaluated extroverts as narcissists, and I'm going to make decisions based on that evaluation. And I'm going to pretend that that's reality. You can you can see how this that's terrible criteria. That's terrible criteria to make decisions. Awful, awful, awful. One of the words that I uh, have heard a lot lately is the word agenda, uh, and especially in attach or like an association with a subset of people or a group of people that I don't like. Right? Like I have decided that this group of people is not good, mm-hmm. and so because I've decided that this group of people is not good, right? That's my evaluation. All I can see is that these people have an agenda against me. So if they say something meaningful, valuable, true, you know, like a good representation of reality, I'm going to 100% discredit it, even if it has massive value for me, right? Because I have already evaluated them as having an agenda. I've already evaluated them as bad or wrong. So even if they have imperative information for me, Hmm. I'm not going to listen to it because that's an agenda. That's all part of an agenda, right? All, all of this evaluative, you know, material that we, that we come up with, that we think, we feel, that we believe is a reflection of reality, all of this frames our world in a very personal way. As in, like, I might need the information that person has, but I can't get it because I prevent myself from getting it because I have decided that that person has an agenda as evil, right? Because I've not created any subsets, right? Oh, those are all just liberal progressives. Oh, those are all just right-wing, you know tea partiers or whatever it is like whoever is the person that you think has this terrible agenda they might actually have something of value to give but we shut it down right because we have this zero-sum game right if you win i lose and if i win you lose right yeah that's not how it works but we we pretend as if that's how it works and we make our decisions based on that and i think it actually retards the progress of all humanity right like these zero-sum arguments these you know these evaluative criteria that we project onto somebody else's terrible ill intent, right? Or this terrible motive, and we can't see them as subsets. I think it actually retards our progress. We could be at a point right now in humanity, right? We're like, I mean, we have the, we have the technology to create nanobots that go in and repair ourselves on a, on a massively microscopic level, right? Like nanobots, like these tiny little, basically the, they're like these little machines that go in and repair our bodies. Do you know what the the significance of that is? Oh yeah, we could live forever. <laughs> that that's ridiculous sci-fi hoodoo crap from the future, and it's and the technology is available now. Why aren't we just all focused on that, right? Like, why aren't we all just focused on the the implications of that? Well, because we're dicking around talking about like you know whether or not the right or the left is you know good or bad, and we're like creating bills just to create bills, and we're like you know, I mean we just we we have all this you know, this this cloak and dagger stuff going on in our heads when real solutions could be, you know, put on the table and we can't even see them. We can't see them because our definitions in our head won't let them, let us see them. So I think it actually, I mean, it just doesn't, it doesn't have just like micro implications, like for me as an individual, I think it has macro implications for us as a society. Yeah, and you can see why people 
uh, grossly oversimplify categories. I mean, we just we take an example from the 1930s when Adolf Hitler in Germany was giving rousing speeches. He was taking an entire people group, you know, the Jewish people group, and he was lumping an entire people group together, grossly oversimplifying and and grossly misrepresenting this entire people group. And because of that, he was able to motivate an entire movement, an entire country to rally behind ostracizing and ultimately eliminating through genocide an entire people group because he didn't have any distinction. And obviously he did this on purpose. This is, you know, he was a great orator, great in the sense of he was good at what he did. He understood the power of language, the power of persuasion, the power of speech. And he he realized that by removing distinctions between Jewish people, he was able to lump them together and get an entire country, an entire people group to demonize this agenda-driven subgroup and basically send them to their death, send them to their slaughter. And people went along with this. So this is powerful on both sides. And we've seen probably more examples of, of political leaders, of dictators, of, of cult leaders grossly oversimplifying and grouping than we have seen true leaders making distinctions. But I think we're, we're seeing a change coming. And I think I'm hopeful because I believe as, as we move forward in the world, we're seeing people that are understanding these kind of distinctions. Technology is rising up to the point where we have to get more nuanced. We can't grossly oversimplify anything anymore just by the nature of reality. I mean, we just have to be more, you have to have higher fidelity in how we describe things. Yeah. And I think this is leading us to a better way of seeing the world. But you can see why people did it. You can see why news, news outlets, news media, politicians, leaders, you can see why they grossly oversimplify because it can rally people. Yeah. It can motivate and it can get an agenda accomplished. Yeah. Well, it's powerful. Well, and if you need any more, if you need any more, you know, persuasion that getting to a point of really understanding general semantics and, you know, these subsets and being more careful about your definitions, if you need any more persuasion around that, it actually inoculates you against being so susceptible to propaganda. Yeah. Right. Like all of us think, well, I would have never, you know, I would have never thought that that was okay. I would have never been so easy to hand over my mental power to, you know, this propaganda machine. Yeah, you would have, especially in that time period, because that's how people thought. Right. In the 40s, people thought in terms of propaganda. They thought in terms of sound bites. And we still do. But we now have we're we're more postmodern about it. Like when we hear a sound bite, we're able to go, oh, that's a sound bite as opposed to before. We didn't even identify it as a soundbite. We couldn't even see it. So I think soundbites still work on us. I think, you know, this overgeneralization still works on us. But as gen- I-, I agree with you. As a generation, I think that we're getting into a more postmodern way where we can go from the outside and look in. And the more you understand this concept of general semantics, the more you understand this concept of subtypes and that people have to be more careful with their definitions in order to persuade you, right? Because that's where you evaluate through persuasion, right? Or... You, you you use persuasion to help somebody evaluate, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's the point of persuasion, right? I want to persuade you to make decisions, right? So I'm, I'm trying to influence your evaluative criteria. The more you get to a point where you don't just buy a soundbite, right? Like, you don't just buy a definition, right? You go, oh, which, which homeless group are you talking about? Which gr- Jewish group are you talking about? Which, what, you know, fill in the blank group are you talking about? And... And, and force a subset, force mm-hmm. a greater, more granular di- um, distinction, right, or definition, the less susceptible you are to propaganda, the less susceptible yeah. you are to these sound bites, right? Somebody says a sound bite and you don't just buy it because that sound bite isn't enough information for you. You need more content. You need more definition. And so I, I think that that's a great example of why understanding this discipline and actually starting to think in these terms is very important for us as individuals. I'm hopeful. I mean, the state of California recently just made a decision to start the process of releasing from prison, state prisons in California, all nonviolent criminals, right? No, or, uh, or most uh, drug-related. Drug related. Drug-related yeah, nonviolent yeah, yeah. criminals, right? And I remember here on the East Coast, here in the United States, I mentioned this to somebody, and they're like, that's terrible. They're letting criminals free? <laughs> 
<laughs> in their mind, a criminal is a criminal is a criminal. It doesn't matter whether they stole a pencil or they committed a murder. There's no distinction. They should all be locked up because they're criminals. So we still do this today. We lump everyone together. And, you know, the state of California is at least making an effort, I think, now to start making a little bit more distinction around the type of criminal. And we do this a little bit in the justice system as far as, you know, sentencing and things. But it's it's pretty jacked up. And often people are just lumped together in this giant system with no nuance, no specifics. And you can see, I mean, obviously it's caused a problem of overcrowding prisons, of uh, more crime, you know, just a burden on the system because there's no distinction here. Everybody's lumped together. But we still think in these terms, people are like, well, they're criminals. They should be locked up. What kind of criminals are they? Are they rapists? Are they murderers? Are they just drug possessors? I mean, there's a big difference here among all of these types of people. So we can see that, yeah, we look back at the 1930s and 40s and say, well, that would never happen. But it happens now in, in different ways. We have our own, what I would consider American concentration camps, which are these prisons that people are locked into. And we're totally okay with it. Some judge has said they're a criminal, so we just lump them in with everybody else yeah. and throw them in a jail somewhere. Yeah. I mean, come on. And take weird pleasure in this idea that they might be ass raped. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty jacked up, actually. I, I think, actually, I mean, California, I wouldn't be surprised if it's not based on more sophisticated ideas of things like general semantics and more like what you said, that they're massively overcrowded. Yeah. And I think this mentality has gotten us into hot water. And the problems we've created from not being able to create distinctions, the problems that we've created through this, we're going to have to now solve. And the only solution is to create better distinctions. So the overcrowding in California has made them go, hmm, maybe we should let some of these guys go. And maybe we should let the ones who are nonviolent, <laughs> you know, marijuana possessors, which is now officially legal in all of these different states and medically legal in California, maybe we should let those guys go, right? And so... This not observing general semantics concepts has gotten us into hot water, and observing general semantics concepts is what's going to get us out. Yeah. So what do you think? Have you thought about the way you define things in your life? Have you thought more about, uh, you know, using more nuanced language to describe different people groups, different ideas, different abstract concepts? Are you an introvert and you think all extroverts are terrible? <laughs> We'd love to hear from you, whatever it is. <laughs> Come over to our website, personalityhacker.com. Uh, also, you can join us at our community. It's a growing community, facebook.com forward slash personalityhacker, or you can hit us up on twitter.com forward slash personalityhack. And if you like our podcast, please go to iTunes and rate us. We're also, every time I go to the podcast iTunes rating and I see that another person has rated it, I get really excited. <laughs> it delights your soul, isn't it? So please delight my soul by going to <laughs> iTunes and uh, rating, our, rating our podcast. And subscribe while you're there. We'd love to be a part of your life uh, every week in and out. We'd love you to be a part of this discussion with us. So we want to hear from you. Again, personalityhacker.com. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. This has been the Personality Hacker Podcast. We'll talk to you on the next episode. <laughs>